Thank you for watching Conscious Consumer Network. The live stream broadcast is free to view. You can pause and rewind live broadcasts to catch up or view shows at a later date by accessing our free archives of all shows. Check out our broadcast guide to see what's on. You can show your support by donating to our network support fund. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter or subscribe to the monthly newsletter for updates. We thank you for supporting free and independent. Good evening, everybody, to wherever you may be in the world. Uh, my name is Mel V, coming to you live from Conscious Consumer Network headquarters here in Portugal. It is great to be with you, as always, for our scheduled broadcast being Stop South African Genocide. We have our co-host with us being Karen Smith. As always, Karen, it's wonderful to have you with us. And um, we have, of course, our guest tonight being Dan Root. And um, we've only got an hour left of the show, so we will be... Jumping straight in, and I'm just going to let Karen get firing with those questions. Hi, Dan. It's great to have you with us again. I haven't spoken to you in a while, but it's wonderful to have managed to get you here. Yes, well, it's nice talking to you again as well, Karen. It's been a very long time, but I've been off air for more than a year now due to some surgeries. But I'm up and back in the fight, and uh, I hope to be seeing more of you in the near future. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, Dan, so we we need to jump right into this. I think the, the, the thing of the day is the Zuma vote that we just had, uh, where he has once more survived a vote of no con confidence by a very small margin. What are you, your thoughts on the, the, the whole state capture story leading up to this vote of no confidence? And where do you think we go now? Is South Africa going to burn tonight? Well, not necessarily, I, I don't think. Um, and, you know, this whole thing has been very much uh, media-driven in South Africa, and I'm always very skeptical of our mainstream media in South Africa because they don't really have our interests at heart. And for some reason, um, you know, they, they've got this obsession about Jacob Zuma. Now, obviously, Zuma is a fairly checkered character, and he's been in all sorts of um, issues and he's got you know all those corruption um, charges against him that have been stored in the courts and so on but but you know um, the problem is that corruption in South Africa cannot really be personalized you know it's, it's a systemic problem and I think a lot of other people in the shadows have actually uh, probably embezzled a lot more money than, than Zuma or the people around him, and, but those remain completely off the radar screen. And, they, and the media are simply going for Zuma, and then they've got this obsession about him, and obviously I, I think there are some intelligence agencies involved as well, because all those um, the so-called so crypto emails were uh, apparently stolen from, uh, from the server somewhere, to, uh, to the media and they've been feeding all these email stories in, you know, um, into the news over the last few weeks and months. So I, I'm, yeah, I just ask myself, uh, you know, what is all, all this in aid of? Because um, I, I think the people who want to take over from Zuma probably don't have our interests at heart either. And, and you've now got this kind of um, almost an unholy alliance between the formerly sort of left liberal party, the DA, and the, the sort of far left uh, Afro-Marxist um, economic freedom fighters, and they are actually um, governing together, although there's not an official coalition, but in some of the metro cities such as Johannesburg and Victoria and um, Port Elizabeth down in the Cape. So, you know, we, we don't really have much of a choice at the moment. I mean, the opposition doesn't look too good to me either. And and we're sort of between the devil and the deep blue sea, as it were. So I think we, we've got to come up with our own kind of autonomous political movement, but uh, it's very difficult to communicate to people because the media are simply, you know, trying to work people up about Zuma and getting rid of Zuma 
whatever that might mean. Um, you know, we all know that his wife is also his ex-wife. Wife, uh, nobody's quite sure which it is. She's waiting in the shadows to perhaps take over from him. But uh, the people who, who designed this system uh, in the early 90s, um, they, they should have foreseen this, that ultimately, you know, some form of Zulu nationalist party or an ANC dominated by Zulu nationalists who will hold power in South Africa because they are, uh, they have the biggest numbers. And nothing, you know, we can do at the moment to, will change that. Unfortunately, we will have to change the system or South Africa will have to be partitioned or something for, for, for a change to take place, for a real change, not just a kind of one, replacing one figurehead with another. Yeah, I, I very much agree with you, Dan. My, my big worry was, so Zuma goes, what then? What then? Who steps into that gap? And as you said, you doubt if they have your interests at heart. Well, they could be 20 times worse. Exactly. Because, you know, I, I see, I, you know, I, I've been telling a few people that uh, Zuma is probably as good as it gets, you know. I mean, it, it doesn't sound very optimistic, but, um, uh, you, you know, so as long as we have this current system, we're not going to get any good leader and, and probably, as you say, I mean, people can't imagine that you could get worse people. But, you know, if you look at Robert yeah. and Bobby in, in Zimbabwe, we could get somebody like that. Or we could get Malema. I mean, yeah. Malema is mm -hmm. you know, far more anti-white. And yes, and I mean, he's definitely somebody you who know, kind of push almost uh, sort of a state-sponsored genocide of whites in South Africa quite easily. I mean, you could see things de deteriorating to that extent. Yeah, I, I think I think that has been my biggest worry all along because when uh, Malema was expelled from the ANC, everyone took a deep sigh of relief and thought, well, that's the end of him. And he came back stronger than ever with the EFM in place. And uh, he has just gone from from bad to worse, literally, because he's aligned himself with with Mugabe, with the, the Castros. He thinks Venezuela is a good way for South Africa to go. It, 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 it's craziness. But he has the support of the young, um, unemployed, unemployable black following. And there are a lot more of them than there are of us older people nowadays. So, so that has always been my big worry. What are your thoughts on the possibility of him because he said, if Zuma go goes, he will consider an alliance with the ANC. Now, that is an unholy alliance, if ever you thought of one. Yeah, sure. Of course, he was the uh, former leader of the ANC Youth League. And, and that's where he first started uh, making kind of political noises, including sing, singing those anti-white songs such mm. as uh, Killer Poor, Killer Farmer and so on. Uh, and I think he's now realizing that it's, it's, it's a tall order to build your own party in opposition to the ANC and, and you know, I think he's keeping his options open and possibly, you know, as you say, he has said that he might want to rejoin the ANC uh, together with his followers and, and you know, form one big black mm -hmm. Uh, radical political party again. Um, but come back to those people, you know, the, the opposition who want to get rid of you know, I mean, they, they've obviously agenda. And it's that some of these big blocks and so on are being frustrated that they don't have access to the state because and they resent the fact that Zuma and his uh, you know, Indian associates have now got a very cozy relationship with uh, some of those contracts and so on. And, and they would rather be in that position. And, and I think they want to, they want to regain access to, to the state finances and contracts and so on. And you know, South Africa has been virtually pillaged over the last 20 years, you know, all these ESCOM contracts, I mean, you know, the companies are in dying and they're all 
they've lost huge amounts of money, but but that money went somewhere. I mean, it ended yeah. up in somebody's pocket to provide other employees of those companies, or there were uh, vendors who sold certain things to those companies. Um, you know, this whole Dupi uh, power station that they're building um, to you know increase our uh, supply of electricity. You know, I've heard that a lot of foreign companies have benefited from that. There are also kickbacks paid to some of the ESCOM officials. Yeah, um, the, the whole thing is ridiculous. I mean, the we used local engineers and companies. Yeah, Dan. Sorry, it, I couldn't hear it, It's horrific because even the train company, I mean, I, I spoke about that, I think, two years ago, about the, the, those billions that were spent on the new train system that don't fit the rails in South Africa. Now, where did all that money go? And and that has come out in the last two weeks about the guy from, I think it's Prada, who the, the kickbacks and the amount of money that went into that. So, so... Everybody in South Africa loses except those on the gravy train. Yes, exactly. And I, and I know here in Johannesburg, for example, uh, I mean, there are all these buses. Yeah. Uh, they call Raya, Raya buses. And I read somewhere that um, that whole system cost $15 billion to, uh. um, to set up and build. And, I mean, hardly anybody uses it. So, I mean... But obviously, some supplier got paid 15 billion rand to yeah. build all of this stuff and probably make huge profits in the process. So that kind of thing is going on all the time, and uh, and, and, that, and that's not necessarily linked to Zuma. I mean, it's, it's throughout the system that, that you find this kind of thing. And, in, and here in Johannesburg, I mean, I'm just amazed every day driving around and seeing all these... Um, you know, black people and Ferraris and Porsches yeah. and, yeah. and, and so on and the dining at best restaurants and you see them in the lounges and five star hotels and so on. And I and I just wonder, you know, how do these people sustain their standard of living? And obviously it must have some connection with state funds and obviously there's a affirmative action too in the private sector, but I think most of it uh, is related to um, you know state spending and, and graft and so on. So so we we've got a huge problem. So do you think it's just part of a, a, a of the black culture um, that you give backhanders and etc. Because because it's just so enormous. The numbers are so big when can't wrap one's head around it. The, the numbers that are thrown out in the press. You know, this one would pay back so much, this one kick back so much. It's huge numbers of money. Um, the, the, I, I just don't understand, unless it is part of your culture and you accept it as okay. Because uh, Zuma told a journalist this morning, your time, that, that uh, oh, your grandmother is corruption. And he said before that corruption is a Western paradigm, so it doesn't apply to him. Um, is it just so much entrenched in the black culture that that it's acceptable and not something to frown on? Well, I think the various books have been written about that. Uh, you know, there is a tendency in Africa towards corruption and tradition you did business with a tribe, then you had to bestow certain gifts on the chief mm. of the tribe. Mm. And that kind of culture, I think, it continues. I mean, you've got a country like Angola where um, your Santos' daughter, Isabel de Santos, uh, she's the richest woman in Africa. Mm. And, I mean, her father has been in power now for about 34 years. He's now stepping down and she's going to take over from and, uh, but, you know, she's had lunch with Financial Times in London and so on. So um, I think the Westerners are also to some extent involved in this. Uh, quite, you know, corruption in Africa is quite profitable. And I think a lot of the multinational companies, they also participate in it. And I think there's a certain section of, I mean, a, a kind of globalist 
flying in Johannesburg and perhaps in Cape Town who, who don't mind the, the, these conditions at all because uh, ultimately they they benefit the rich and the corrupt and but it's, it's, it's a burden, it's a great burden on the average person of a middle class taxpayer because he just sees uh, you know, his funds squandered on all these big projects mm. and um, tenders and contracts and so on. Um, but a lot of the big companies and rich people, they, they benefit from that. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that as well, Dan, that it, it couldn't continue if the big companies did not participate in it. So they bought into it and they allow this by their participation to continue. And and I, I mean, it's been centuries back to, to achieve anything in Africa, you have to pay bribes and kickbacks. But if we didn't do it, that culture would surely have to die. Yeah, sure. If, I think if there had to be um, you know, a strict policy by the corporate sector not to participate in mm. that, uh, but uh, and, you know, then it would possibly come to an end, as you say. But uh, I've always maintained that this whole system of affirmative action and lack of economic empowerment is a form of institutionalized corruption because um, they, it's, it's legal and, and it's required that yeah. you dish out free shares and uh, bonuses and high salaries to politically connected black people yeah. and that feeds the corruption because all, the, all that easy money you know, creates a whole culture of um, having just having access to um, collective funds either in the by way of pension funds or government funds uh, and, and you see that all the time uh, in the chat when you hear about these schemes and read about them. But of course, the the other issue that you know, we've got here is the is the violence that, that, that's still continuing. Um, I've just just done an article on our Afrikaans website about these uh, house attacks and not too far from here in Boulder's Drift. And last Friday, someone got killed. A man was shot dead um, when he went outside of in the early Early on Friday morning, he went outside his house, and then he, he got shot. Uh, he returned fire, but he was eventually killed. And, and uh, the next day, on Saturday, a woman was shot as well, shot in the back, and she's back in good condition. So that kind of goes on all the time, um, and then that's sort of underside of this kind of Hollywood life. The corrupt oligarchs in South Africa is the extreme violence and you know, the social tensions that, uh, that you find as a result of corrupt policies. Yeah, the, um, I, I'd like to speak to you about that because I've seen numerous reports of the increasing violence and murder against whites. Uh, this, this year has been horrific. Um, we have almost as many murders of farmers this year to this point that we had the whole of last year. Um, why? I did think it was because of, uh, of uh, the elections coming up, but I can't believe that anymore. It, it, what do you see as the back reason for this sudden, well, not so sudden, but the, the immense increase this year? Well, you know, I I think South Africa is a country that is plagued by ideology. Um, you know, before uh, we were a lot more pragmatic and, and we tried to find solutions to all of the problems in that country, um, you know, providing education and health and so on. But, um, you know, ever since these revolutionaries started gaining traction in the, in the 1980s, we've 
become increasingly ideologically driven. And I mean, both mainstream media and the ruling party, but especially uh, these extremist groups like the Economic Freedom Fighters, and there's now another organization that's sprung up uh, calling itself uh, Black First, Land First. Uh, they are openly um, advocating you know, illegal action against whites and against their property, and they are demonizing white people. And, and you find that the media, uh, to some extent, they're also fascinated by these extremist groups on the left. Um, you know, most journalists being also, to some extent, uh, inclined to be uh, leftists, um, they kind of admire these really extremist uh, yeah. uh, groups such as Black Land, Black First, Land First, um, and maybe the Pan African Congress and so on. Um, yeah, and, and all of this propaganda is actually feeding into the violence and into these attacks. And you also see in how the media respond. I mean, the, um, whenever there's some sort of a minor incident, for example, there, there was some sort of fight that broke out a few days ago with the KFC in Victoria. And we don't really know the circumstances, but it seems to me like a, a version of road rage uh, where somebody looted at somebody else and then four whites got out and beat up a black uh, or slap them or whatever but, but this is now that was for a few days we were treated to this as being the latest example of extreme yeah. racism in the yeah. country and whites who have not been adapted to democracy and so on and they, they make all sorts of deductions from a, a, quite a minor incident like that but whereas on the other hand um, you know all of these extreme incidents where people are tortured to death or shot dead or killed or attacking their own homes, that's not seen as significant of anything, you know, as, as signifying anything. Um, and the media always play it down and they just say, oh, well, this is just normal crime, and, you know, it's unfortunate that you've got to be yeah. there. Yeah. Poverty and unemployment, and if a person is feeling poor and unemployed, it's his right to kind of go out and kill someone. Yeah. So, We've got a huge problem uh, in terms of the perceptions out there and the kind of propaganda that, that we are subjected to all the time. And I think that that causes a lot of the violence. Um, together with the sort of the population profile where we've got a lot of young black people and young black men especially who tend to be violent all over the world, whether it's in Africa or the USA or Britain or France mm -hmm. So then, then that's also a fact that you cannot unfortunately escape. Yeah. But I also blame a lot of, you know, I also blame the media and a lot of the white commentators, especially liberal commentators, that they have actually let a situation like this develop where, you know, all of the more pragmatic ideas and conservative ideas have all been suppressed and ridiculed in favor of extremism and we are now kind of seeing the fruits of you know 20 years of uh, extremist propaganda and so on that were that was disseminated in this country yeah. and unless we turn this around I mean yeah going to find ourselves in dire straits and then we can only end up in, in a similar situation as Zimbabwe. I mean, obviously South Africa is far more developed, it's a richer country than Zimbabwe, but you, you cannot have, uh, you know, these ideas and ideologies being the dominant ones in a society without ultimately paying the price for it. I mean, there was the Russian Empire that that in the late 19th century was an up-and-coming and quite prosperous country and industrializing and so on. And then it had a communist revolution. And, you know, for most of the 20th century, Russians suffered terribly under that system. And unless we 
we can get out of this um, straitjacket that we're placed in. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be extremely difficult. And, and um, it's going to be more violence and death and um, you know, upheavals as we go along. You're seeing this worldwide, though, because we've got this, uh, uh, you know, I'm in the United States, and you can see that here, that those many, many years of leftist thinking in schools and universities have created a whole generation of what they call now snowflakes or social justice warriors who just cannot, cannot see the wood for the trees, stand. They are so socialist-leaning that if you ask them, what is socialism? They actually can't answer you. It, it, it's just you being mean to me. And we all need safe spaces and little corners with coloring books and crayons because, oh dear, the world is so mean. How do these people have a chance in a future world if, if everybody's a winner because you participated? And even if you didn't, if you were just there, you're a winner because, oh, my goodness, you did so well. It, it's awful. We are not taught anymore uh, um, how to compete. And isn't competition the whole basis of the world? I mean, it, it gives you reason to want to be better, to improve yourself. And yet none of these leftist-leaning people believe in this. It, it's an absolute disaster for the whole world. Yes, you're quite right here in that, you know, our dilemma is also part of the international. Uh, you know, it's an international situation um, and the, the, the sort of left with the lurch that we've seen here at the universities and media uh, has been replicated all over the Western world. I mean, there's not a, almost not a single university left in the West that is not, at least as far as the humanities are concerned, that is not dominated by Marxists, really feminists, mm -hmm. cultural Marxists, um, um, you know, third world people who prefer um, third world cultures to the West and, um, and you know, they've got these notions of white guilt from colonialism <laughs> and, and all of that. So, yeah, I mean, South Africa is sort of, yeah, at that level, it's just uh, a cog in a big machine, and, and we're just in the forefront of some of these developments because yeah. we, we've just been surpassed demographically to such an extent. Um, I mean, it, it, it was a graph published in the press and in the media over the last week or so showing the population growth of the black people in South Africa who went from about you know, a few million, maybe five, six million, um, in the early part of the 20th century to over 40 million at the moment. Yeah. And the white population has grown very slowly. So, yeah, we, we've just been outnumbered mm. to a certain large extent. And, and that process um, is taking place all over the world. Yeah. Uh, I've actually written an article about that where I mean, the UN is predicting that there will be four and a half billion average by the, by the year 2100. Yes. So, in a way, the whole world will become like South Africa, demographically and otherwise. There will be the same violence and disorder and probably also affirmative action and, you know, domination of the Westerners by others um, as we experience in South Africa. So, so, it's quite a bleak prospect if we don't get our act together and come up with solutions to, to this huge crisis facing us. Yeah. Um, uh, Christine, I've been asked to ask you if, if you think that the commentators and journalists are being influ influenced by intel agencies and globalist agents. Do you think that is why your press and our press um, are, are so left-leaning and just pushing one agenda down our throats but it, yeah, endlessly. You never hear any other thing from them. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, and I think in South Africa, I, you know, I can definitely see that there are some people who mm, do not have our interests at all. Mm. Uh, whether you're white or black, I mean, 
they're not their agenda is something else and they're pushing that one and mm. and yeah and, and the whole press and media scene in South Africa has been infiltrated by by these people why and, and some of them must be paid agents by even some of the foreign intelligence agencies and so on. And as a general rule I think South Africa has never had media that actually that were actually patriotic and you know writing about what's good for the country. Um, it's always served on foreign pictures with the just sort of colonial mining companies, Britain, um, you know, the anti-apartheid movement or something like that. They, they've never really, the mainstream press in South Africa, have never cared about locals at all. And they're very internationally minded and globalist, uh, as you would say. So, yes, I mean, our main fight really is, is against the mainstream media. South Africa because they are paralyzing people and the way people are being swept up at the moment against Zuma I think is part of this process because they, I mean, they, it's kind of a diversion from the main issues you know and, and the main crises facing us yeah. um, I mean they, they, there's this fixation now about getting rid of Zuma and Zuma must fall and all of that which is not going to help us in any significant way. But at the same time, you know, people are literally dying every day in violence, being impoverished, right? You can see our economy, uh, you know, stagnating, and our currency weakening, uh, and you know, our education system at the universities are obviously going down uh, with all these so called protests um, and radicalism taking root there. So instead of addressing all of those problems and coming up with plans and thinking about the real issues, um, yeah, I mean, people are just being entertained with uh, this so political drama around mm. Mr. Zuma. And then today, I think one of the left-wing commentators paper, the Business Day, actually wrote that it was going to be predicted it was going to be a damn squib, and, and that was what it was. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. it, it has changed nothing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, tomorrow we still have to face what we have to put up with every day. Yeah. But, but you know, Dan, it's exactly the same thing here. You have the anti-Trump movement, the never-Trumpers here, and you have the Zuma movement there, anti-Zuma movement there. It, it, it's spreading worldwide. We're having exactly the same things there as here. It, it's like looking in a mirror every morning. I see what's going on in the USA, and then I look at social media, see what's going on in South Africa, and it's exactly the same thing. But it, it, what they have a saying here you know, look squirrel. So look over there and don't pay attention to what's going on here. And that seems to be exactly what, what are they doing in the background while they entertain us with this whole dog and pony show, you know? That's what scares me. Yes, certainly. Um, and that, that's what I've been saying, that uh, I think there are some very powerful behind the scenes uh, in South Africa, you know, in the States, they, they talk about the deep state problem. Yes. Yeah. Um, there are also um, some very sinister characters who have really benefited from the system over the past 20 years, you know, got extremely wealthy and powerful, mm -hmm. security companies and, uh, you know, probably, you know, private intelligence agencies and so on and they are manipulating a lot of these public events and um, and they are really um, raking it in you know, they, through, by all sorts of means and maybe supplying this on some of these uh, state-owned companies uh, so yeah and, and, and the poor man in the street he's not in the picture at all you know he's just seeing the stuff happening on the surface that's being dished up to him every day mm -hmm. um, 
with all these journalists, this army of journalists serving um, that agenda. And exactly, yeah, I think mean, it's exactly the same in the US, um, as you say, the, the hysteria around Trump and mm. um, the Trump must, you know, must be impeached or accused of um, collusion. Collusion with the Russians and, and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, but Dan, you and I have been saying for years and years and years, you need to look at South Africa to see what's coming your way. And boy, is it ever hitting the rest of the world faster and faster. You know, we had, we had small increments in South Africa so that we barely noticed as the changes happened. Unless you were really politically aware, you didn't, you just went with the flow, you know, and changed your life according to the way life was going. But it's so fast in Europe. Uh, they, I don't know how they're ever going to recover from this because we're used to living with Africans. They are not. They, they, they seem to have had this picture of the noble savage. And, and, and of course, we must help them. And look what's happening in, in, in Europe now. It's, it's horrifying. But the people have no defense against it because they've been so liberalized that of course we have to help the whole world it's our duty to do this and they're being overrun yes you, you're quite right there um, I, I saw some street interviews with people in Paris not so long ago and yeah and a lot of them when they were being asked questions about whether they wanted foreigners in that country uh, and whether these foreigners were a uh, blessing for France, um, all of them would reply, reply in the affirmative. Yes. Uh, because they've been so conditioned not to think about the consequences mm. of immigration and you know, uh, having to accommodate people from very different cultures and customs and habits and um, Tendency, tendency towards criminality and breaking the law and so on. That uh, yeah, they, they are not. They are just not prepared for what's going to hit them at all. I mean, the average person here lives in a gated community, mm. tries to get into one, or he's thought to buy his house, and he's probably probably owns a gun, and, he, and he's very careful about where he drives and what sort of areas he can visit. Uh, at what time of the day, but people in Europe are not used to that kind of life at all. I mean, they think that uh, you, you can just go out any time in the street and, uh, and people are fung fungible and everybody is the same. Mm. Whereas there, there are huge differences between populations and cultures, and that's something that we have, uh, you know, centuries of experience. So, so, that, you know. so I think in, in that respect, um, yeah, I think that the entire world could learn a lot from the South African song. And also, you know, what's quite amusing to me is that now the European Union seems to be discovering a lot of the old apartheid ideas from the yes. <laughs> I mean, they, they They're now talking about, oh, we must, we must develop the African countries to make people stay in their own country uh -huh. and that's exactly what the national party tried to do in the 1960s you know they were uh, developing the so-called Pontistans and in the hope that uh, there wouldn't be population movement towards the cities in south africa and there would be these independent states all around us that could develop by themselves and attract and keep their population anchored there so now the European Union, you know, they, they, they're rediscovering the wheel and it's not going to work for them in the same way as it didn't work for us. Yeah. Unfortunately. And, and, and history is simply going to repeat itself on, on a vaster scale as Europe uh, goes down the same slippery slope that we've gone uh, on now. Dan... In your opinion, was there any way that we could have averted this 
happening. For instance, had we voted no instead of yes in the referendum, yeah. do you think it would have made very much difference to the way South Africa is today? I think it would have made a difference. Um, you know, nothing is inevitable um, unless some sort of boxes in it, you know, about a century ago when um, all the like, Russian communists had this idea of historical inevitability that communism was a preordained system um, and that eventually all countries in the world would become communist, but they just didn't uh, kind of fantasy dreamed up by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in the 19th century. So there's nothing inevitable about our situation. It could have been very different if we had had better leaders and if we hadn't been misled and if um, you know we've been more circumspect um, and yeah I mean there are look at a country like Israel whatever you might think about Israel they are not simply capitulating to their enemies and you know, uh, there's huge criticism of them but they seem to weather that and we could have done the same and we could have stuck to our guns and you know tried to um, yeah, I tried to create a, a society uh, that, that would have been more prosperous and more fair and uh, better suited to the conditions on the ground in South Africa and in Africa than in this situation that we've got at the moment, which, um, you know, the, it's a sort of idealistic, egalitarian utopia that people talk about. But but that's actually on the ground. It's, it's something like you know from a Mokita side novel. It's a sort yeah. of strong and there's just cruelty and sadism and sexual violence and havoc taking place every day. Yeah, and and there's a complete dichotomy between you know the official discourse and the public discourse and all the talk about human rights. And the reality of the situation, which is mostly consistent daily violations of human rights and basic freedom and the dignity of the people. Yeah. yeah, so we could have had something quite different. Um, I mean, South Africa, I think during the 20th century, was almost a, a haven of peace in the world. I mean, we, since the end of World War, that ended in 1902, we never had a war in our own soil. Um, we, there was no any famine. Um, you know, there was a steady development throughout the 20th century. Um, it benefited um, most of the people here. Even though blacks are highly critical of uh, our history and so on, I mean, if you compare the standard of living to that of Africans elsewhere on the continent. I mean, it's like chalk and cheese. I mean, yeah. they, um, and they've, they've got fairly decent housing, they've got transport, hospitals, and, and the hospitals before were, were a lot better than the ones we've got at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, they, 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 there's a huge crisis in the public health sector in South Africa. And, and that we didn't have before. Mm. So, yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, oh, Mr. Cat, I don't think he was properly thinking, decided to go down the route he did, and he dragged the whole of the population along with him. And, um, and, I, and I think there were, were people at the time, including as far as I've heard, um, Sir Lawrence von der Post, who, who was quite shocked by um, some of the steps that uh, the attack took to, you know, to facilitate the takeover by the ANC and the South African Communist Party. So they, 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 that's definitely been a huge mistake. And, and most, you know, the 
sober-minded see that, that the client may be miss on the negotiations and you should never have to sort of even like it now to, to the NC in the South African Communist Party. But unfortunately, I think the same thing could happen in Europe, it could happen in America, but at a, certain, at a given point, um, under demographic pressure and ideological pressure and religious pressure from Islam, certain European countries could also simply capitulate and within a few years find themselves being run over uh, by migrant populations. We're really seeing signs of that happening and somebody like Mrs. Merkel is <laughs> the sort of Mr. Mr. in the making. Exactly the same modus operandi. She doesn't care about her own people. She wants to be seen to be politically correct and accommodating towards uh, foreigners and yeah, and, and the, the left liberal media. So uh, yeah, history could unfortunately repeat itself uh, in the same way all over the Western world. So Dan, now I want to ask you the question, that the, the, the 20 million, million gazillion dollar question. What do you see as the, the end result for whites in South Africa of this lot? Because right now it is not looking good. I read this morning that by 2040 there will be no whites left in South Africa. I don't believe we've got until 2040, but that's, that, that's just my opinion. Do you see any way that we can turn this around in South Africa and let the whites remain in their country? I think we could turn it around, but, uh, you know, we've got to be very clear about what we're up against. And, and this whole ideological struggle and propaganda war has been fought against us, waged against us for so many years. We will have to um, score points in that war and, and you know, persuade people that another, another solution uh, is possible for South Africa and that there could be, you know, the, the, the partition of the country, there could be a system that takes into account the ethnic diversity of the country. Uh, because throughout the 20th century, you had um, hundreds, even thousands of books being written about our future and what it should look like. And even in liberal circles, it was thought that the worst possible solution for us would be a kind of a system, one man, one vote, you know, takes all, uh, the kind of dictatorship of the majority like we've got at the moment. And, but that's exactly what Mr. De Klerk chose in the early 90s, you know, people around him, uh, which is, is just a total horror. But we, I mean, I think we've still got all of that thinking that was done over a century about South Africa, and we could, even though it no longer perhaps uh, applies um, you know, directly to us, uh, the country has changed as it has become. Um, you can still learn a lot from it, and there's a, a, a body of thinking there that, that could be readapted and reinterpreted and, and renewed so that we can um, you know, envisage, implement um, some of the, those ideas again in South Africa, and perhaps it could be a lesson to the whole world. It could be something that, that, that could also save a lot of other countries. Uh, but we have to, you know, we have to be adamant that, uh, that we won't just uh, accept what's imposed onto us, and we have to, you know, fight that, uh, you know, be very uh, active combat of ideas, because that's ultimately the domain will be lost. I mean, in, in the late 80s, South Africa apparently had the 
fourth or the fifth strongest army in the world. I mean, nobody could beat us on the battlefield, but we were ultimately beaten. You know, we, we lost not by the sword, but by the pain. Yeah. And that's where we need to focus ourselves. And we mm -hmm. got in combat these um, left-wing extremist ideas and multicultural ideas, globalist ideologies that we find in South Africa today. And if we can succeed in that, then yeah, I think there's still a lot of scope for us because we're still quite rooted here. We still own a lot of the land in the country. We're still producing every day, uh, despite all the difficulties. And you know, there's still a lot happening in education. Some of the schools are still quite well run. So there, there's still hope for us, but we want to turn hope into um, into yeah, into action. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we will we'll have to work very really hard at it. So, do you think, um, Dan, the same as they're they're saying here in America, is that this is where the alternate media like us uh, comes in, because the mainstream will not touch the question of South Africa worldwide. They will not touch it. Although I do believe that there's a broadcast on the BBC tonight about today's vote and the things leading up to it. But mainly, um, the mainstream doesn't touch the question. You don't hear anything about South yes. Africa. So yeah, is they don't and that's going to win this battle? Yes, exactly. I, I think that that's definitely the case. Um, there was an article in the New York Times a few days ago where they were talking about uh, the influence of you know, dissidents or alternative com commentators on YouTube mm. and where YouTube has now become the main platform for the dissident right uh, globally. And yeah, I, I would say that, that that is the way to go. We, we've got to use social media and Media, digital media to put our message across because we, we're not going to see it in the mainstream media. I mean, they're almost embarrassed about South Africa, although they want mm -hmm. to uh, you know, all of the, the, the utopia that was promised to us. None of that is realized. Uh, and I mean, there, there's a session in hysteria about Zuma. I think it's also indicative of the fact that, uh, yeah, I mean, South Africa has not turned out to be such a great place as they said it was going to be under black rule. So um, I think we they're on the black group and we should now, you know, come with our critiques and our and alternative ideas and you know stand on our stand up for our rights. Right. Dan, thank you very much. That has been uh, a Although short, a really informative chat. Um, really glad to see that there are some really clued up, uh, educated people in South Africa and people who, like yourself, utilize the alternative media such as ourselves to get the truth out there. Um, it's been lovely chatting to you and we would love to have you back again. Uh, let's talk to you about scheduling you in for another chat at some stage and um, we'll uh, love to get some more of that information from you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, yeah, let's keep up the good fight. Thank you. thank you very, very much, Dan. I'll I'll send you an email because we we had such a short time this time. I'd like to have you on again soon to keep up the momentum. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much, Dan. It's, uh, my pleasure. Brilliant. All right. Um, that's it for tonight, everybody. If you want to catch the archive, please check out ccn.media. Otherwise, you can catch Karen on RadioFreeSouthAfrica.com. Dot com. Uh, Dan, just give us your details where we can find your stuff. No, you can get it on our English website, prog.org, P-R-A-H-E.org. Um, you can also follow me, Dan Ritt, on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and make contact with me there. Um, I've got an on site pro.co.za, p o r a a g dot co dot uh, So and yeah, we we're also developing quite an active YouTube channel, uh, Prog TV, p o r a a g TV on YouTube. So you know, uh, keep, keep a lookout for those. 
Okay, brilliant. It's been lovely chatting to you, Dan. Uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. And Karen, thank you as always for being a fantastic co-host. Uh, that's all for tonight on Stop South African Genocide, folks. We'll see you again next week. Take care. Bye-bye. If we want to change the world, we must first change the media. Mainstream media exists for the purposes of indoctrination and manipulation of public perception. The world of free and independent media is growing. And with the upsurge in information now available in the public domain, it has never been easier to access free and independent media. The exploration of this information resulted in an experimental project which would provide a fully supported space for researchers, whistleblowers and seekers of all kinds to express themselves and educate the world. On the 1st of January 2015, Conscious Consumer Network was launched to the world. Nobody thought we would make it this far, but CCN is the longest running free and independent media network of its kind. CCN is a unique collaboration of hearts and souls, bringing you information from different perspectives to educate and inform. Since we started CCN, we have had only one desire, the pursuit of a free, fair, just, sustainable world. And this has not changed. Having overcome many challenges over the last two years, CCN is here to stay and we've got great things lined up for 2017. Help keep CCN on the air by supporting the 2017 Network Support Fund.